For Chapter 8, Part 2, Climatology of Atmospheric Storms, we'll look at tropical cyclones specifically. The global distribution, the seasonality, the structure of these tropical cyclones, the impacts they have on the coastlines that they hit, the predictions we have in the future, and also the effects on sea surface temperatures. Here's looking at Hurricane Katrina in 2005. It's well known this hurricane caused great damages around Louisiana, specifically New Orleans. It was a very expensive and damaging hurricane. 2005 in general was a very active year for tropical cyclones. $180 billion of damage during this year. This is a composite image that overlays a number of the serious storms that happened during that year. Dennis, Katrina, Rita, Wilma, and also Emily. So atmospheric scientists call these type of storms tropical cyclones. That's the generic name. We call them hurricanes in the Atlantic Ocean and the Eastern Pacific, so other sides of the United States, we know them as hurricanes. We call them typhoons over in the Western Pacific, so ones that impact Indonesia and Japan. And also we call them cyclones in anywhere in the Indian Ocean and typically anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere. We call them cyclones there. There are other local names in different parts of the world as well. The Saffir-Simpson hurricane intensity scale is how we rate these storms. As opposed to tornadoes where we don't actually directly measure the wind speed, in hurricanes these days we actually do measure the wind speed directly um, by hurricane hunter aircraft that fly into the hurricanes and that measure the maximum sustained wind speed for the storm. So they go into different quadrants of the storm, different sides of the storm, find the maximum sustained wind speed and that will be used to rate the storm. So wind speeds greater than 74 miles per hour are required to be classified as a hurricane in the first place. If you have wind speeds below that in this kind of system, it's called a tropical storm. Once you get into 75 miles an hour or so, you're rated as a hurricane class one. As you get up to 100 miles an hour around your class two, going up to the strongest category five, which will have wind speeds around it at about 155 miles an hour or greater. Now this is correlated well with the central pressure. And of course, what we know about the pressure gradient force, the lower the central pressure, the stronger the pressure gradient force, and the stronger the resulting winds around that low pressure zone. The impact of tropical cyclones, and what regions are fatalities from tropical cyclones greatest? Well, these places like Bangladesh and India that have huge populations along the coastline, they're the most vulnerable. In fact, a tropical cyclone killed half a million people in Bangladesh in 1970. Hurricane Mitch killed nearly 20,000 people in Central America in 98, and then Tropical Storm Jean killed more than 2,000 people in Haiti in September 2004. That specific Storm Jean had a lot of inland flooding associated with just heavy rainfall. Loss of life due to tropical cyclones has been greatly reduced over time in the United States due to satellites. We can see now what's happening. You have to imagine back in the old days, they, they didn't really have a sense of what was coming other than large waves approaching the coastline, which would give them a day or two notice. But now we can see many days in advance a developing tropical cyclone and get out warnings. We have computers models, which can tell us with some accuracy which way the hurricanes will be heading over time. We do have nice warning systems in place in many areas, and we have evacuation procedures in place. Since Katrina, those efforts have been upped quite a bit. There's also many ways that the public are getting educated about the dangers of these types of storms. Hurricane damage costs in the United States. Katrina is the big number there at $81 billion in 2005, with Hurricane Andrew about half that price at $45 billion in 1992. The Florida hurricanes in 2004, they kind of got hit by a number of hurricanes in a row, Charlie, Ivan, and Francis, totaling to about $40 billion there. Worldwide hurricane occurrences. Now we're looking at all the tracks from 1985 to 2005 around the globe. You can clearly see the highest density is over here in the Western Pacific. And that's because to get the formation of a hurricane or a tropical cyclone, you need to have a big area of warm water. And that's just what they have over here. We've described the circulation over here. We have trade winds blowing warm water. The Western Pacific warm pool exists over here. So hurricanes feed by evaporating warm water, taking that water vapor into the clouds, condensing it, and using a percentage of that energy, that latent energy, uh, to translate it into kinetic energy and rotation in the storm. So here's an area where there's plenty of energy by the form of warm water. You also have some warm water sources over here along the East Pacific, giving you a good abundance of tropical cyclones as well. 
Here in the Atlantic, we do have plenty of hurricanes, but you can see when, when cast globally, not really as many as many other parts of the world. So while we hear about this a lot in the news when hurricanes pop up here, globally, it's a small amount of hurricanes compared to what happens over in Indonesia and also in the Eastern Pacific. And you do see some tracks around the Indian Ocean and the Southern Hemisphere as well. Now in previous lectures, I've described semi-permanent high pressures that live over the oceans, especially during the warm season when the water's certainly warm enough to support hurricane growth. And these are major steers for the tracks of these. So I put these in here to show you why a lot of the tracks go along the western side of these semi-permanent high pressure zones. The other thing you might notice is there's no hurricanes right at the equator. And this is because, it's not because there's not warm water there, there's plenty of warm water there. This is because you need warm waters plus Coriolis forces to actually get your initial rotation around the storm. So you need a low pressure to form and then you need winds to spiral around that low pressure. That's only going to happen when you have enough Coriolis force, generally five degrees or more off the equator is necessary. To give you some idea how those high pressures can actually introduce variability in the tracks in the Atlantic Basin, here we have our Bermuda High. This thing can move around depending on the weather conditions. Right here I've positioned it in the west side of the basin. So Hurricane Lily in 2002, the red track, would take a track around that high and end up slamming into Louisiana, for example. Other times that high can migrate over towards the middle commonly, or sometimes it could be even further right in the basin. If it's out this way, then any hurricanes that form will not be forced to slam into the United States. Instead, they'll stay out in the Atlantic Basin, which generally is good unless you're driving a boat through there. So the position of this high really can greatly influence those tracks. When the subtropical high circulation is very weak, sometimes it's just not very pronounced, you can actually get way more erratic paths for these hurricanes because there's not any major steering mechanism. Here's looking at tropical cyclone tracks. In the Atlantic, they have 1851 to around the present, and over here in the Eastern Pacific, they have 1949 to around the present. So you can see that density here, and you can also see that there is a progression of these tracks to mostly, on average, go around the steering winds that that subtropical semi-permanent high provides. The general structure of tropical cyclones, as shown from your book, there's an eye where there's generally descending air coming down the center of the eye. Typically that meets up with convection right about the lowest half kilometer. There's an area where those two air currents meet up. So there can be low level convection in the center of the eye. Some of the eyes are perfectly clear without a cloud in sight. Other eyes are more obscure with low level clouds and you can't really see to the ocean bottom. There's an eye wall that surrounds the eye. These are the most strong thunderstorms in the hurricane itself and also where the pressure gradient is the strongest and therefore the strongest winds. So strongest rain, strongest winds are in the eye wall themselves. All the air that comes up through here, a lot of it gets exhausted out the sides of the hurricanes as shown by the arrows here. What's not shown in your book is that some of this air actually ends up descending down the eye. That's the source for a lot of the air coming down that eye. And the air in the eye is quite warm for two reasons. First of all, there's a lot of latent heat released in these hot towers or these clouds over here. So there's warmth by being next to the eye wall itself, although most of the warmth is from compressional warming. As that air descends the eye, it's forced to warm due to compression. Other things that are notable, there is a migration of air moving into the center of the storm up the eye wall. So air is flowing into these storms and then up. Besides the thunderstorms in the eye wall themselves, there's also what are called spiral rain bands that are clusters of clouds going off of the eye wall. So here's a better visual of what actually happens in these hurricanes. Here we have the eye. You saw descending air is a red flow coming down here. Around that you have cyclonic winds spiraling up through the eye wall clouds. Again, the strongest thunderstorms, strongest winds there. You also have spiral rain bands that are coming off the main eye wall that also have really strong amounts of rainfall. They just don't have as much wind as the eye wall storms do. At the top, many people don't notice this, but you do have a dense cirrus overcast, otherwise known as a cirrus shield. So these are icy clouds at the very top of the troposphere that form during the exhaust process of the hurricane. 
The interesting part of this is that, yes, cyclones, of course, rotate cyclonically at the bottom here, but the exhaust actually comes out anticyclonically. So at the top, if you really look at the cirrus clouds of an active hurricane, you can see that the exhaust at the very top is coming out in an anticyclonic or clockwise manner in the northern hemisphere. This is Hurricane Dolly showing you a radar image. So radar images are bouncing a signal off of rainfall themselves. So we're really looking at the amount of rain and ice that's present in here. So we can see, first of all, lots of rain in the eyewall clouds here, as shown by reds. But also, there's plenty of rain in these spiral rain bands. And here's a better image to see how the spiral rain bands come off the eyewall and spiral out. Again, the spiral rain bands have plenty of rain. They just lack the significant winds that the eyewall storms have. Also pretty nicely shown here is in between the spiral rain bands, not as much is happening. In fact, there can be sinking air in between these spiral rain bands instead of rising air. Some simple hurricane energetics here. If we consider an average size hurricane with about a 665 kilometer radius, and if that gives you on average 1.5 centimeters per day of rain, which doesn't seem like a lot, but you have to consider that parts of the hurricane are raining, other parts are not raining. So on average, it's a probably a good ballpark estimate. If you take that volume of rain produced for an average hurricane, you end up with 2.1 times 10 to the 16 cubic centimeters per day. One can convert that to mass using the density of water and then to energy using latent heat, and that will give you 5.2 times 10 to the 19 joules of energy per day, which is expressed as about 6 times 10 to the 14 watts. That turns out to be 200 times the worldwide electrical generating capacity. About 1 400th of this latent energy is converted to kinetic energy. So the rotation we see in the cyclone itself. So they have a huge amount of power to work with. They use a very small percentage of that to translate into rotation itself. Now there's no doubt that the hurricane winds can be damaging. However, it turns out that the storm surge is a more destructive force on average for hurricanes as they arrive at coastlines. The storm surge is an abnormal rise in sea level associated with a tropical cyclone or a strong extratropical cyclone. So you can have a storm surge with any type of storm. What are two primary causes of the storm surge? The first is the onshore winds. If we have a cyclone in panel A here that's moving from south to north along this coastline oriented kind of from southwest to northeast, you will find that on the right side of the cyclone in the northern hemisphere, you will have to add together the rotation of the storm plus the forward progress, and you end up with a higher wind speed on the right side, but also the winds are onshore. So that's gonna force water up on the shore, giving you a higher surge on the right side of the storm, what's called the northeast quadrant. On the left side of the storm, since the rotational winds are actually going offshore, um, first of all, the overall wind speed is weaker because you have to take the rotational wind speeds and subtract the forward progress, but also they're offshore, so they're more dragging water offshore and, and not causing a problem with surge. So again, as an example, just to give you some numbers, if this thing was moving 10 knots forward and the rotation around a center point was 100 knots, on the right side of the storm, the total would be 110 knots onshore wind, and on the left side of the storm would be 90 knots of offshore wind. The barometric effect is because there's such low pressure. Imagine having 900 millibars of pressure in the center of the storm. That actually means there's less mass above you in the atmosphere pushing down. So if there's higher pressure outside of the storm pushing on the surface of the water, but lower pressure in the center, the sea can literally bulge up. It doesn't have as much force pushing it down. So it literally can rise up. This is definitely a second order effect this is the main cause of surge, the fact that you can have onshore winds piling it up. What three additional factors can enhance a storm surge? Well, it's typically wave heights. If you have high wave heights on top of a surge that's already pronounced for, from these two effects, either the onshore wind effect or the barometric effect, any waves on top of that's only going to increase how far that water can push inland. Also, the time of the tides is definitely important. If your hurricane reaches shore during high tide, that's a worst case scenario. The shape of the coastline is actually a really important mechanism here. Over here with a flat coastline, what will happen as the water gets pushed against the shore, if it's flat, there's a chance for the water to move sideways and just add up to a very strong alongshore current. You definitely wouldn't want to swim there, but it may not cause that much surge if there's an escape path for the water. If you have a bay, such as New Orleans, 
you have a problem because if you push water in the bay and you're keeping pushing that with very strong 100 mile an hour winds or so, it gives the water no choice. It can't come back out the inlet. It's going to end up piling up on the surrounding coastline instead of coming back out there. So the U.S. states with the most hurricane landfalls from 1900 to 2008. Definitely Florida is the winner there, and that's because they're really in a position where they're going to get any storm steered around that subtropical high pressure system has the best chance of hitting Florida first. Texas is number two because of the size of the coastline and also because they're downstream of the very warm Gulf of Mexico waters. And then also the Carolinas get hit quite often as they represent a major part of the eastern coastline. And Louisiana is in there as well, just being right to the right of Texas, again upstream of those warm Gulf of Mexico waters. Climate impacts on hurricanes. This model in particular showed between a control run and a run with high CO2 and surface warming and increased sea surface temperatures as a result, what they found was that a reduced frequency, here's the control run with the open circles here, that has a number of category 4s, some category 5s, some category 3s, the high CO2 run had a decreased frequency over all of hurricanes, but a tendency towards stronger hurricanes. So the consensus forecast with anthropogenic climate change is for less tropical cyclones overall, but a higher occurrence of stronger ones. If you add in sea level rise to this, which is definitely happening, you could certainly expect huge amounts of surge and impacts from these strong storms. Now you can look at the reverse. What are hurricane impacts on climate? From a peer-reviewed article by Purdue University, so they found that hurricanes mix warm surface water with colder water beneath. I describe that as a very stable situation, and it is. However, you can force the mixing to happen if you have hurricane strength winds. This is an important mechanism because the hurricanes have the strong winds that are able to do this. So this is really important in the tropics because that's where pronounced stability is, and otherwise the waters won't turn over. They found that the hurricanes are responsible for 15% of the vertical heat transport in the ocean at those upper levels when it's digging in to those warm surface waters. They find this is a negative feedback since the water in the hurricane's wake is colder and less likely to support another hurricane. So what this means is that the hurricane churns up the water, leaving in its path colder water, which is not likely to support another hurricane. The question is in the future, is that going to change? Sea surface temperatures are rising, and if you increase the depth of that warm water, you may get the warm water layer so deep that even hurricane strength winds cannot dig down deep enough to turn up colder water. If that happens, then after a hurricane comes through, the water's just as warm as it was before, which does not limit another hurricane for forming. So that will be an important thing to look at in future scenarios. Now this GIF animation is showing just how pronounced and over how big of a swath of the basin hurricane tracks leave cold water. Here's Earl and Danielle. After they came through the Atlantic, they left maybe a fourth to a third of that colder, much colder than it was before the hurricanes were there. So they definitely are an impact in mixing the oceans. Other ways they can cool the water besides just mixing up colder water from beneath to the surface, well, they evaporate seawater. Evaporation cools the surface of the water. They also produce rainfall. Rainfall forms at higher heights where the air is colder in the upper troposphere and falls on the ground, also cooling the ocean. So there's many mechanisms that hurricanes can cool the ocean. Research into these climate effects is really in its infancy, but it's thought to be important not just now and in the future, but possibly in past climate fluctuations. So summary from the last part of chapter 8, storm climatology, we looked at tropical cyclones. We found they form primarily over big swaths of warm water and away from the equator where you have enough Coriolis to get them spinning. They evaporate seawater and then they condense it aloft, giving them huge amounts of latent heat, of which they use a small percentage to turn into kinetic energy. The paths are influenced greatly by semi-permanent highs that exist over the subtropical basins. Storm surge is the biggest threat and the biggest money concern and loss of lives in these storms. Models suggest less tropical cyclones in the future, but stronger storms overall. We can't have 100% confidence in that. However, a lot of studies are showing that. They do mix warm surface water with colder water beneath. In places like the tropics where it's really stable water, this strong mechanism to physically mix that water together 
can be very important in changing sea surface temperatures. 